I couldn't find. It. Hello, sorry, I was uh, I, they were being I was being questioned about my last paper. Okay, so we are we are on. <coughs> so try to uh, speak loudly. We don't have a um, microphone. It's not necessary here. He said that he can he can actually questions and so on. So I hope you have some nice questions. So who wants to go first? Speak up. I'm sure there would be questions, right? So how do you get rid of the uh, neutrino signals from the... <laughs> 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 Well, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> no. no, actually. Um, so uh, why don't you repeat what, what this is yeah, so, about? So the idea is that um, the neutrino signals are. Um, so you, you are looking for um, dark matter, correct? Uh, yes. Kicking off uh, a target inside the neutrino detector. And basically, so you are. We are looking at, uh, in fact, I, I was actually, that's very, very funny. Um, so, I, so basically, you are, you are trying to do uh, the same as you do with neutrinos, but what you do is you try to have some timing, of, uh, because the neutrinos are much lighter than the dark matter, so you expect uh, the different behavior of, of the dark matter. Uh, versus the neutrinos, and um, they are trying to do. They are, they are actually exploring different uh, possibilities <coughs> to see how they can kill the neutrino background because this is the main the neutrino interaction background, right? Okay? But the neutrinos they they are sending it impulses, okay, and they know exactly how they are sending the neutrinos. The dark matter is not in that way because you don't know what you are generating. You are generating, and it goes through through your. Uh, Part of it is the beam dump, you know, you have to basically, uh, you, gener you, decay, you generate the dark photon, or the dark photon, the dark photon decays into dark matter, one of the dark matter goes away, the other one goes into the neutrino. So the behavior, they can, they can try to understand better how the neutrino pulse goes, time the neutrino pulse, to get rid of the, of the, of the neutrino background interactions. The neutrino, they know what they are doing. Better. The dark matter is much fun. Has, has this been tried? Uh, actually, the mini micro boom, the mini boom, sorry, uh, has done some analysis of the data. And I, I was looking at my own slides because, you know, as I said, this is not something honestly that I um, that I have worked on. I just looked to, to come here because I, and I, I was very happy. But to, to do that, but if you they have done, um, if you look in my plot, the, the micro boom, the ma mini boom data, that is the only thing they have done, is much worse now than in the Bavari okay, or so. So, so they are only have look at very tiny amount of their data because it's an idea that came very recently. And so they are trying now to, to improve. Yeah. So it's a very, very early stages. The, if you look at the plot that I'm looking at here, the, the mini boom, uh, Analysis is just with a very tiny piece of uh, data, and I, I really don't know much of the details. Uh, my my colleagues uh, at Fermi are the ones who propose that. So uh, Ron Harnick and Bogdan Lebrecu and uh, Claudia Fugelli, that was a postdoc there. They were the first that thought that they can use uh, <coughs> neutrino <laughs> neutrino detectors like mini boom or micro boom now. Or future uh, uh, in order to try to see uh, that matter. Uh, but I know that the main idea is that you know much about the neutrinos and you know the fun policies, you know when you are just kicking much more than what you expect from the neutrinos. Um. So you told me about the Bindam experiment like mini boom. In the experiment, uh, you told me if proton hits the target and they make a lot of pions and it decays to dark matter particles, right? So are there any possible methods to decay to dark matter particles other than pions? Uh, you can also scatter off directly, correct? Uh, uh, when you, when you, you have it. enough energy to create uh -huh. the pions, then the pions or the ethers or so, the pions will decay into their photons, let's say, correct? 
so one of the photon will convert into a photon, right. into a dark photon. Uh, if not, you can just scatter uh, against the, the same way as they are shown from the electron uh, beam, you can scatter against the, the, the nucleus, correct? Right? And so you get a kick to your proton, and then the proton radiates the photon Directly. slash photon prime. So it's the, that's the easiest if you don't have enough to move them. But you can also, so there are two ways you can do it. You can, you can do it, uh, if you have enough energy, we'll create the, the, next, the, the pions. And then the pion will, will decay. If you don't have enough kinetic energy, then you have uh, you just scatter off the nucleus and, and eventually give a kick to the proton, and then the proton will decay and have some radiation. And the radiation will convert these eight primes. But in terms of them, Total number of the dark matter particles, pion decay is better, I think, because there are a lot of pion and they can decay. But if you need to grab some open fluent scattering, then only one dark matter particle, only one, a pair of dark matter particles are produced. Well, it really depends. Well, it depends. You are always generating the photon prime, right? So, in one case, the photon prime would be a bit more energetic, I suppose. Uh, but the photon prime will always decay into two matter particles because it can do other things. So as far as you generate, as far as you, your epsilon is such that you created the photon and the photon goes to the photon prime, you will decay into the matter particle. Then you have to see that the matter particle decays in, in your beam down. And so the kind of matter goes one way and the other one finally you know, travels enough to hit the neutron detector. But the, the, the idea is that no, because the neutrino detector is so big, you will have opportunities to, to get a kick of this dimatrium electron or dimatrium nucleon. Or, so that's, that's the idea. Question for Christoph. Um, so, in direct detection, the field, there's sort of this fundamental line, which is the neutrino floor, where basically it's not really the end of the game, but it, you have to radically change the technology. Uh, is there an analogous thing in indirect detection? Is there any sort of <coughs> limit that people can see at this point where you're going to have to really, really change what you're doing? Yeah, that's a very good question, um, which is not so easy to answer. So in direct detection experiments, you have a reason to be honest. I mean, basically, you're fighting with one background, right? So, so what you measure ultimately is one spectrum, uh, and the fundamental limitation comes from as you go to, to like, uh, modulation or, or like, uh, like a, yeah, direction reconstruction, ultimately uh, the ultimate limit comes from the systematics of the neutrino flow. But indirect dark matter searches, you basically have to answer this, this problem in each direction of the sky more or less because the backgrounds just are different. So if you talk to about dwarfs, for instance, it could well be that they are just dark, uh, a couple of orders of magnitude deeper in sensitivity and then the fundamental images from the statistics side would come from from uh, yeah, would be you know, fundamental limitation right now is just statistics so one could easily build a Fermi that is hundred times larger. I don't know. On the moon or whatever, if you have tons of money, like you would still hit no no limit. You could just continue the searches and at some point you would have an amazing statistics and so on and so forth. So there is no limitation necessarily from that side then this is where the limitation that ultimately sits depends then on the frequency range that also will be different for gamma rays and for uh, X-rays and for radio and so on. And I think it's right now simply don't know because there are so many different targets one, one could consider. So for instance, for X-ray searches for this 3.5 kV line, um, people have looked at all kinds of systems, at galaxies, galaxy clusters, groups of galaxies, the Milky Way halo, the Milky Way center, and each time you have to fight with different backgrounds. So, and, and also instrumental backgrounds. There also it's not, you can go through the individual papers and then each time you have other systematics and limits maybe at some point, but it's not so clear where this really lies. So th this is actually something I try to do at some point in the future, but um, in, this requires basically having first full sky predictions for signals from everything that could emit a, emit a signal, then reasonable predictions for all backgrounds 
and then a statistical method that tells you from these like very complex sky maps what actually can you see and what not. So that, that's a tricky problem. Would that question make sense for primordial black holes? Um, so I guess it depends because there are so many different ways of detecting them. It's a much more variable question. So, for instance, microlensing, your limit there is there are actually compact objects in the form of stars. Mm -hmm. So, Eros and Math, and also probably supernovae and quasar microlensing, yes, you can find 20% compact objects and those are the stars. So for that one at least there is a definitely a similar thing. Um, I think I'd have to go through them one by one and scratch my head very carefully. Yeah, I guess an interesting aspect is also that if you think about the fundamental limitation for one object, this might be different from the fundamental limitation that you have if you have a thousand similar objects, because you can use these objects to learn about the typical background system models and so on. So, yeah, probably just makes the question. Do you think that this can be resolved from the, from the point of view of the entire detection? So for, for the galactic center? Excluding, excluding a signal. Or I, I think what uh, even less confirming, of course. <laughs> excluding, but if you cannot exclude, you're going to confirm me at this point. Uh, yeah, I, I guess what you can, can do ultimately is, so, so if it's about the GB access, one can probably say at some point, that a very good fraction of probably 100% of it comes from, from these same classes. Then, get, then this makes the GDX meta signal much less interesting. Then, what, what the limits actually would be on a signal that's continued subdominantly is then a much harder question. But it's also much harder simply because we, we don't know the dark matter profile. So, it could be that the dark matter profile is such that dwarf limits are anyway much better. So, the dark matter is not peaked towards the center, but just more core. Uh, the, 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 the so, so I think from the galactic center, the only interesting thing is the detection. But, it, it, but there has been a detection. Yeah. The there detection. is a detection. There is an excess. But yes. That doesn't mean that there is a detection. detection. Yes, but if, if you could argue that a good fraction of this excess comes from many second houses, then the excess doesn't have this bump anymore, right? So the, the basically you would remove the characteristic property of the excess so because you don't know how much of this bumpy structure would be the millisecond others and how much it rest. So afterwards there would not be any dark matter like excess left, probably just something else. So what, what, what ideally could happen is if one if I has a good understanding of star formation in the inner galaxy, which one seems to have, and can fold this into modeling of the galactic center emission and then the millisecond puzzles on top of that, then probably one could get it ideally a pretty good description of what one observes. But is that uh, for, for the future? I, I think not, so, so the fun, I mean I didn't talk much about this, but the fun thing is apparently one knows much better, much more about star formation at the galactic center than uh, I thought, certainly than I knew. So the, the point is that one, uh, is there are some models that, that tell you how star formation happened during the last two million years or so, because one sees how molecular clouds move ar around the center of so the black hole. Uh, and basically can see, it, it, it's like they all are aligned and they go around the center and in a, on a, a, a conveyor belt kind of like thing. And, and they 
don't do star formation initially and some at some point star formation switches on and then they just form stars and at some point they all explode. Well, I mean the fast ones explode. Uh, and based on the observations one can make a probabilistic model about when, where, which not which one, but how many stars on average exploded when, where. And this hasn't been used at all in, in this context. The interesting aspect is that this doesn't have a, happen at the center, but that there are some displacements, a couple of hundred of fossils, hundred fossils. And, and so right now we try to, to make predictions based on this levels of observations. Because we see a similar displacement actually in the, in the residuals of the gamma rays that we still have at high energies after some energy. Do you think that this would be, this would be elucidated? Yeah, I don't know. So, so our hope is that we get just predictions that match the data. I mean, the, the, for because the this, there yeah, no, for the stuff. From, so the, there is this millisecond pulsar component, which seems to generate, or might be the millisecond pulsar component, but probably generates the GE excess. And on top of that, there is mm -hmm. something at high energies, which probably is related to star formation, which has a different morphology. And so right now we think about trying to, to get a good model for the second component. And then again, there, I mean, as usual in astrophysics, there's lots of wiggle room. You could then try to hide a dark matter signal below that because there would be always factors to do uncertainty. Uh. But again, I mean, it's, it's only as interesting, I think, as a detection region, not so much as a limit because we don't know much about the dark matter signal. But from astrophysics standpoint, it's quite interesting. Well, you can always hide some. Yes. Yeah. That would be very exciting. Then it would be better to search for it. Sometimes. Because you So the, the thing that could, I think, the best of all words that could happen is that there is a nearby very ultra faint dwarf that hasn't been seen up to now, dwarf galaxy, and that one of the upcoming searches for ultra dwarfs finds it, and then we find out it's, it's close by, it's very massive, and it's a very good target for dark matter searches. Then we have already lots of Fermi data on that <coughs> object because it's a full sky image anyway, and this would immediately make the limits strong of that effect of the field. So this could help, I don't know if it would completely kill the dark matter interpretation. There is however another way which probably gets some more attention now uh, in a couple of months and years, which is simply using the, the Milky Way halo itself. So since we are sitting in the Milky Way halo, you, you see basically the signal from anywhere, high latitudes and so on. It's just very subdominant and a bit hard to analyze because very faint, it's not as bright as, as towards the center. But if, if one just looks at, at, the st on, at this on statistical grounds, then the limits from the Milky Way halo are much stronger than anything else. If you would be able to use all the statistics from that uh, and turn sky. Um, and this has been pointed out, I think this was mentioned in the Fermi Lut projection paper. Basically, they show how good the limits could be if I would understand the backgrounds at the 1 and 10% level, and this is pretty impressive. There's one paper by Chowan, uh, Chowan Huang, and, and others, Tosin Enslin, about this, who mentioned this in PARS, in PARS yeah, might mention this, that they get very strong limits from the halo, but they, their main analysis is about the drug center, and yeah, we are looking into this now. So if one actually gets a convincing handle on modeling backgrounds at high latitudes, this could provide a strong, or stronger limits on the GP axis. I mean, the, the antiprotons could also have been powerful to attack through the GTX. So we don't have any case uh, that we can look at the uh, the Milky Way halo, 
very interesting to see if they have a different feeling. Same, right? They do. And Dan Cooper will let us know. So we will know. So we will have uh, we will have the occasion. But, you know, any of this. Is Dan giving a talk here? Yes, he, he will in, in the second in the second not a, not an overview, but in the second day he's, he's giving a talk. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and also then team uh, in Chisholm. So I guess that they are. In any case, they will be around to express yeah, their opinion. Maybe during your talk. <laughs> After. So, that would be but my talk is about something else. No? So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Please. Sorry. So, okay, I'm working on direct detection, of course, and so I'm biased. But I have a little bit the impression that indirect detection by itself will have a hard time demonstrating that. Uh, the dark matter is discovered. Yeah. And, and that, uh, on the other hand, it's very important if dark matter is discovered in several ways. Uh, the information brought by indirect detection is, is essential to try to understand some of the couplings and, and, and that, for instance, if, it, if there is significant signal, this shows in, in indirect detection, this shows that there is uh, no asymmetry between dark, dark matter and anti-dark matter concept. Uh, no, but, uh, in, I was there will be no annihilation, right? Yeah, there will be no annihilation. Right, right, right. There are yeah. So, uh, I think it's important to pursue that, but the, uh, it's difficult to have an ambiguous signal. Uh, yeah, yeah if you if you could have an idea, if people thought of well, when 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 Fermi was not there yet, you know, if you would have seen sources of you know the spread out in, for every mini halo uh, somewhere, but of course those are those type of signals are not there, so it would not be easy. Yeah, you I, I could have thought that. It could yeah, no. Be. So I, I agree that was where uh, where there is. A, for that to do a little astrophysics to a one is a better candidate than the, the galactic center where everything. Yeah, galactic happened. center is extremely complicated. Yeah. Yeah. So that the, whether or not one could unambiguously identify, unambiguously is not work, but convincingly detect something indirect searches depends, of course, a lot on, on what the model one thinks about it. I think for WIMP dark matter, it's, it's true that. The easy detections did certainly not happen. So if, if something shows up, what might be something that the GBX has or something with marginal statistical significance. Um, but it, it depends very much on the model. If you think about the neutrinos, for instance, they would be super hard to detect directly in, in any way. So they would be first probably seen either because of, of we detect one dark matter or because we see uh, decay lines like maybe this 3.5 KD line. But then the, in principle, I think one could have a convincing detection because one would see this emission simply over the entire sky and correlated with dark matter and redshift in the corner here and so on. So one could show convincingly that it simply is compatible with the dark matter density. Completely different objects in galaxies and galaxy clusters and galaxy clusters here. Completely different backgrounds, astrophysical backgrounds from what you have in galaxies. Then well, this well, usually that's a kind of problem. Yeah, whether this is going to happen or not, that's what I'm talking about. Actually, you were saying this about asymmetric dark matter. So anything that you know, you do, uh, yeah, the, the do other do. partners of the same body dark dark matter is the same situation. Right? So basically, this is one of the of the situations that you look to say that there is no the problem with this uh, CMD. Um, uh, you know, you have yeah, power. Suppressed. Uh, contributions at the at the same times, and always one thing is to have P wave annihilation, uh, so P wave separation. So the, the other one is to have some depletion that doesn't allow to have in uh, annihilation at 
temperatures. And so, so I think that obviously many of those will not appear in, in the detection yeah. uh, at all. Correct. So that if that would be one option to get around um, the bouncing from sea to the but with the KD neutrinos, I have a little propaganda to make. There is an experiment here. It's a tabletop, but a small experiment, AMO type of experiment. Extremely cold uh, cesium atoms. But this is the. Uh, here. What, what is that exactly about? This is um, the, the very cold atoms uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, one of these uh, cold traps, atom traps. Um, and uh, then I studied the case with a 4 pi coverage and, uh, and then tried to see if there is any coupling of any heavier mass uh, state coupled to the neutrino electron. KB is a kinematic uh, issue, if, if, you, if you find that it's, you know, uh, it's, it's called HANDA. We will, we will hear the talk. So it's a so similar Peter, idea. Peter Smith, Peter Smith is the one who will give this, this talk. And so they are starting. They have some money to start. This is not a full blown experiment. This, uh, it's, it will be more expensive. But uh, they are going to, at this stage, they are going to demonstrate the technique. So these AMO techniques are unbelievable. <laughs> so this is a uh, looking at a structure in the Curie plot. Essentially, in, in, in the kinematics, which is exactly kinematics, anything yeah. that would be, of course, the, the limit you get at some point in the in the coupling, right? The neutrino electron is what you produce in this decays or your active decays, and then it has to have some coupling with the with the mass eigenstate, the heavy mass eigenstate. But the range of energy, the range of masses that they can test, is in the KVs precisely, just because of, I don't know. 20, That's, I don't know. It's 20 years ago, there was the famous 17K neutrino, which was also in that region, and which finally disappeared. It, it was, was beta decays. That in that case, it was yeah. in beta decays, right? In, yeah. the, in the end point of beta decays. And this is not, this is a different. Same idea. Neutrino electron. Completely different type of. Uh, of course, you, you will never know if this is the dark matter or not, who knows. But, you know, because any, anything that you will find in the, that you produce in the laboratory, you never know if you're going to. But in any case, at this point, finding anything that is not in the standard model would be a fantastic thing. Anything, anything that is not in the standard model. So, any question? One more question. Um, uh, Marcella, I wonder if you could just like talk a little bit about um, what advantages like E plus E minus collider would have over the LHC for you know dark matter such as disadvantages. Because I you mentioned it. But yeah, right. actually the the type of measurements that are being done in the future with this E plus E minus depending that you could think about them plus E minus being blown like higher level left. And if you think about, so there's now um, then two. And so obviously the, the, the advantages is that, first of all, you're probing different couples okay, of the matter, of the mediator of that matter, um, that are basically testing the couples of these mediators to the electron cell. Um, obviously, there are already the constraints because, as I was saying, um, in some of the models I presented, correct, or in, in, at LHC, if you go into electrons, you have very strong constraints. So, um, so there is a, a bit of a, a balance of how much you can get. I, I don't really know about simulations. There are some projections of that. <coughs> to really in this uh, analysis and for example um, uh, this, this bounce that I was showing for the bar that going to come down then, um, there are there is a full blown uh, uh, set of there was this uh, cosmic uh, frontier workshop that was in Ireland last year 
and then there, there is a very nice write up uh, where they are um, trying to talk about the future opportunities. The, the natural answering electrons are always keen. Okay? And the counterpart is um, if you have uh, something that is only produced by leptons, then of course you are not going to put bonds at the HC. This same thing kind of became two leptons. So obviously, so obviously you will gain by the thinness of, of the, of the uh, experiment and normally reduce the cost of the test. So yeah, you're proving different, you know, you're, I think that what is interesting for me is that all these uh, experiments we are thinking they are testing different uh, regions of, of the matter, even, you know, even uh, uh, thermal freeze up. Right? Um, we will be testing different copies of the so we will help to be an interesting example of of check some type of couples that would be interesting. As I was saying, all these experiments are proportional to some different piece. Unlike, unlike what we say that is for uh, only other matter, uh, that is kind of this Y over the square square. And this simple ways. If also, if you go to models like uh, the sort of all flow long supersymmetry, then of course things that will be explored be totally different kind of interactions. How much, you know, even, for example, correct, at HC you say, okay, if you put bounds on um, neutralino pair production, or you know, chi, chi 1, chi 2, or charge shino pair production. And you see these bounds that go very low, very high. But these bounds, the ones that go very high is because they're assuming some slept on okay, the production or intermediate production. The ones that are only through Davis and Zs, they are not really very highly produced at ellipses. And there, I think the electron collider is being the higher, if it is a higher luminosity, not the two, but if you are thinking now about the ILC, ILC, correct? If you are thinking 500 GB ILC, you will do very well. For, for, uh, this is, it's electron patterns versus. Not I, I don't think, for example, that there's been a clear study of how much you can do for, for um, Charchino light and neutralino light pair production or production um, for 500 shino. Probably, yes, but I think 500 shino in that scene. The short answer you're probably different companies you need to have. You don't know how to match it. Small follow up. Uh, most of the accelerators that are being built, dark matter is not really the main focus, and so you just kind of get it as an afterthought or whatever. But if you were designing uh, an ultra large scale, next generation, whatever accelerator, would you have any preference, or would you basically just be doing kind of the same thing? Uh, I mean, I guess ILC is probably the next big one, but would you focus on that, or is there any preference really? Uh, that's a good question, a difficult question, because <laughs> um, so I, I, I think that obviously, you know, we, now obviously the LHC main objective is to think about something related to that matter, because this is really, uh, which are the questions we are, have left, correct? We need to understand better the Higgs precision measurements, because maybe they are, you know, Things in the uh, details are in, the, in, 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 in so the depth in the details, and uh, you know we're talking about all these uh, um, scenarios with Higgs portals. Right? And all these scenarios with Higgs portals are going to touch precision measurements of the Higgs. Okay, or most of them. Okay, so that's one one hundred you have. Okay. Um, the other things that we are trying to understand, of course, which is not dark matter related, okay, so I guess your question is more broad than dark matter, I assume, is uh, at least what is in my mind is can we learn more about um, biogenesis? And obviously, if I'm thinking about colliders, I'm thinking about biogenesis as something from scale, right? 
the other types of pathogenesis or so or how get to So, which means, you know, um, it has to do with pathogenesis of the microwave scale, it has to do with the heat, it has to do with the true linear happenings of the heat, or any other, you know, in the standard model we know that the heat mass is too heavy in order to have the true linear genesis. So we need physics in the standard model to have the genesis of the true scale. And we want to probe the heat to linear recovery. So I would think about building uh, colliders, like you know, electron colliders would be a good thing to try to learn the most I can about uh, true linear coupling of the heat itself or coupling of the heat to have a potential scale of particles. That would be interesting for the idea of energy. Then going to the idea of that matter, obviously, you know, again, it's kind of a similar answer that it depends how to what is the matter of primary uh, coupling. So I think electron colliders are uh, beautiful to have. Uh, as a scientist, I hope there is a I don't know what's going on. I guess that's sort of the root of the question. Like, is there any direction really? Like, would you prefer any sort of thing? And it seems like the answer is maybe no. I mean, it's, it's kind of nice that there's a, a wide variety we don't of know I think the problem is we don't know, you know, we are a bit uh, lost. Right. We have these questions, okay? We know there is a matter, we don't have to what it is made of at all. And I tried to show today, you know, we don't even have where, where which mass range. And I, I didn't talk about the other, you know, super light, or ultra light and matter, right? That a lot of experiments are going there, and they are exciting, but, you know, and maybe that matter is a bit of this and a bit of that. So that's one package. Then I think biogenesis is the other package that could be, you know, intermediate neutrinos, some models of neutrinos that are maybe helping biogenesis. So these are the things I would like to answer. And colliders could be one way to do it. Of course, we try to see today that there are all these even accelerator experiments that are not colliders and that they can teach us a lot. So the questions are there clearly. Um, we are developing for that matter these ideas of using, for example, other types of experiments, you know, like atomic clocks and other types of things to look at a wider range of that matter because we don't know what it is. I think that um, unless we have a handle on that matter from many um, types of experiments, we are not going to have an idea of what is that matter, right? I mean, indirect detection, uh, could give us a great handle or could tell nothing about our matter, depending on what type of our matter we have. Uh, direct detection, again, you know, if, uh, if you have some uh, type of, you know, uh, Majorana dark matter that is not interacting sufficiently uh, via certain processes and is very suppressed and so on, you know, it may be, or, or you have <coughs> blind spots where really Direct detection is, I don't know, 10 to the minus 50. You know, we are not going to achieve that very often, but it still is there. It's an example. You can build this type of models in some region of parameter space in supersymmetry, for example. And so that would be hard. And then you would try to have... So the problem we have is, I think, we know the questions, but we don't have a good feeling of where the answers might lie. And so we need to be... As, in, as open as possible, because I think we have learned that, you know, going in one direction so far. I mean, LHC has been a huge success, okay, with the, uh, with the uh, heaps. And, you know, when I was reading the proposal and discussing with my colleagues from other areas, they were saying, well, you know, the, the heaps was discovered five years ago and it's so, old. You know, I mean, I was like, these are my colleagues who are scientists. I was so shocked. You know, I, I, I was so shocked, okay. What do you mean? First of all, we still are starting only now to understand the details of the heat. To understand, you know, we only this year we measure, we have a, a, a reasonable hint that the heat scaffold to bottom works, which we didn't know. We have no understanding of how the heat scaffold to the first and second generation works to a good approximation. We have no idea how we generate the masses, the hierarchy of the, of the fermion masses. And, you know, I have worked on that. It's a lot of fun, many models that can generate fermion mass hierarchies, okay? And therefore, we give you different implications for, you know, 
frog and Nielsen type of models, we keep other, other, you need the extra scalars, you need the extra fixes. So we have a lot of ideas, correct? And whenever I feel desperate, as a theorist, <laughs> okay, which happens to me very often, I, I think that Mr. Higgs thought about the Higgs mechanism 50 years ago. Uh, so, you know, it's, uh, so I think... He never thought that it would actually come to fruition yeah. the two particles. So, so, yeah. was, that's what he said, right? That he was extremely surprised that his sort of even almost a toy model actually yeah. worked. <coughs> so, yeah. so, so, you know, we have to I be involved and vented. The tendentious, the, the tendentious actually, uh, question. Um, when people are going to abandon uh, supersymmetry? When? Yes, when? <laughs> <laughs> at least at the electroweak scale, I should have said at the electroweak scale. Right? When, when are they going to abandon supersymmetry at the electroweak scale? Like, uh, I think, you know, because there is the, the minimum supersymmetric is not normal. Then there is the next, uh, and then the next to next, uh, and then they extend that the next to next, and then so 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 I forgot. So at some not, point, uh, uh, you know, it's this uh, is not better. You know, I, I have worked uh, a good part of my life in supersymmetry, and also a good part of my life in extra dimensions and couples, composite Higgs, correct? Because I, you know, so they are the two opposites, correct? Of what you can, in which direction you can go, and I think it's super interesting to think. Okay, you know, there are um, many ideas of how the heat can be a composite state. And you know, if you think about the, the connection or the parallelism with QCD at a higher scale, sounds like a very good possibility. Uh, again, Higgs physics will be able to test at some level uh, ideas of Higgs, com composite Higgs models, <coughs> if we have a very high precision of, of Higgs uh, couplings. Uh, the models are limited not less complicated than the many, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the supersymmetric extensions, right? How many ideas you have. Um, so I think that we need to test ideas that make sense to us for a reason or other, right? I mean, uh, the composite Higgs idea is nice because we already know how it works at least at the level of QCD, so maybe it also works at the level of and TV, you know, at a different level with other. Um, so as scientists, I think we we have to go and try to explore. And I think for your question specifically, when we will leave QCD, uh, QCD. <laughs> when we will leave a supersymmetry, if, you know, if at some point we have a real um, uh, signature that is clearly, you know, something saying else. something else. I don't think we will leave it otherwise. If we really discover something that is incompatible with supersymmetry, for some reason, okay, which I will think probably is hard, uh, because we look at quality evaluation, and as my husband says, you can do any model in the world with supersymmetry plus a quality evaluation. Plus, plus, bio, plus uh, yeah, quality yeah. evaluation. So you can do anything with a quality evaluation. Uh, so I think that really the, the answer is uh, they are, they are, the reason we are exploring this is because there are many different directions to explore, and the only way we will need supersymmetry is if we get something that is clearly incompatible with supersymmetry. That's different people opinion. get different answers, so we need to ask. Because coming back to your question about what kind of machine, it's extremely difficult uh, to answer. Uh, when I was a very young physicist, uh, CERN built the ISRB, uh, it's the first collider. Uh, uh, it was two, 250 G per beam or something like that? Mm -hmm. uh, no, not like no, that. No, less. Less, 50 G, 50 G per beam. 50 <laughs> G per beam. Yeah, 50 G per beam. And this machine saw nothing. Uh, it's partially because we had the wrong idea uh, at that time. We did not know about our processes, large transverse momentum processes. Uh, the, uh, so the instruments were all built to look in the forward and the backward direction. 
and actually one uh, uh, very famous <coughs> instrument at, at CERN, biggest magnet at this to try to have not too much interaction with the machine was a split this split field magnet. So the, ma the, the magnetic field was zero at 90 degrees, was changing sign at 90 degrees. Well, all the physics, <laughs> as we know now, was very So it was, uh, so we had the wrong idea and we, and we had basically the wrong so finally, at the end, there was some indication of the jets, but that was the very end and it was not very clear. When we built the antiproton proton collider at CERN, the first thing that we saw were very nice jets. Uh, 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 and, uh, so the energy of the machine was not good enough to be. Uh, the, the ISR was not, in, not enough to give you this spectacular demonstration. And the other instruments, our experiments were wrong. We were designed in the wrong way because we were not looking for the right thing. The similar thing happened at the, the first quite really large E plus E minus storage ring uh, uh, sphere. One of the experiments got the same ideas uh, of the ISR, looking in a very na narrow solid angle and did not see anything. And only when Mark 1 was available, which was probably nearly four by detector, did we see the psi and the psi prime and the, the charm. And the, the physics was totally different than what we were So basically you have to try to design a machine which is as a broad, uh, it covers a broad uh, spectrum of physics and have it, instruments which have as broad, uh, or as broad, uh, and as, as broad searches as possible. That's wrong, it seems like. <laughs> I think it, it's better to to design one machine that has this broad, whatever, I don't exactly know what that would look like, or, or design <coughs> multiple experiments. And, and the problem the money is, you think, is money it's limited. Well, exactly. I mean, and that's, I think the root of that question is how, how the funding time is limited, divided at this point. The, the and the next, personnel the next generation of accelerators will be very few. Yeah. And probably with worldwide, uh, if there is any, say, probably yes, there will be one, but I'm not sure where, and it will be with uh, money from, from everywhere. everywhere yeah. Yes. So these are, these are really, at, at this point, the competing experiments are. There could be competing groups, competing experiments, and not competing accelerators. So this is the end of this. It already, when we the LHC, we already saw the end of the competing accelerators. Right? There cannot be two, three, four of the same kind. It's too, yeah. too expensive. Yeah. Of course, it's too expensive. Too expensive for what? If you compare with the uh, defense budget of the United States, it's not so laughing. It's laughing. The border war. The cost of the the cost of the of building, not maintaining and operating, but building the ILC in Japan was comparable to the cost of extending the four or five highway by one lane from four to uh, from for each side, so from eight to ten uh, for a certain number of kilometers, right? And it was comparable. And so you see that actually. But the issue is how much money we can get from society for science. So that's, that's the issue. You know? So it's limited, right? So. And, and one thing which is important, it, and that's one of the reasons I, I actually moved from particle physics per se to what I call particle cosmology, is that we can get important information from other means, <coughs> from other areas. Astrophysics, okay. Uh, 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 actually, most of the things that we know beyond this, this type of model is coming, <laughs> is coming uh, are coming from astrophysics. So that may give us some idea of what we're doing.
Okay, I think. Do you do you have any other question? Something? Okay, well, let us take our. our